Now, the, the talk that I'm going to give today is um, uh, trying to think a bit about the issues that we're facing in today's Internet to transfer a large amount of data. I'm talking about data that is uh, bulk delay tolerant. And um, I'm going to see the impact that it's having on the network, and I'm going to try to discuss some of the possible solutions uh, to cope with these uh, problems. Now, before I get started, I would like to uh, kind of go a bit over the, air, the different waves that the networks have been going through over the years. Now, um, if you look at uh, the beginning of the networking, uh, it was from the 30s to the 60s, and um, in there, uh, the focus was wires, and it was uh, communication between people. It was voice communication among people. In the second phase, it was after the 60s, the internet was created, and then it was, the internet was built on top of the telephony network. It was using the same wires in a different way, uh, and the focus was for computers to talk to each other. And then um, in the 90s, that's when the web started, and then uh, the web used the internet as a platform for people to access content. And it happened to be that the web became kind of the most successful application that was running on top of the internet. Um, now, if you think how the internet was designed, it was designed as a very, very thin layer. It was designed on purpose as a thin layer to allow for a lot of innovation to happen on the top layers and a lot of innovation to happen at the bottom layers. Um, but this thin layer, it was designed so that any application could run on top. And, you know, there would be all these innovations happening uh, on top of the Internet. However, the fact that it was not optimized for any particular application, it meant that it was, uh, uh, that for some areas, it was not truly uh, doing its best. And in particular, uh, for content delivery, I think uh, the, the Internet at times has been struggling. And I'm going to give you some examples. So... You know, after the, the web started, um, if we start thinking of what happened soon after uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee created in, Gen in Geneva, uh, we started seeing that much of today's internet infrastructure to handle content is being an afterthought. And um, well, for a lot of the times, we've been playing catch up. Um, I'm sure you are all aware about all the infrastructure that goes behind the curtains in the internet to make sure that we are able to scale the delivery of content and we have uh, content distribution networks and large data centers with uh, thousands of machines around the world. Um, however, it's, ne it's not always being very easy. Um, in this slide, um, I have uh, two snapshots of the CNN page. Uh, the one on the left where it shows a regular uh, CNN page on any day with uh, lots of multimedia content, images, very rich. And then on the right is the same page uh, during the September 11 attacks. As you can see, um, as people were rushing into the web in the same way that they were rushing into the TV to see what was happening, uh, the web just couldn't cope with the load. Uh, so the only solution that CNN had at the time was to strip off most of the multimedia content that there was in their pages and then just provide a very simple text-based um, uh, information so they could actually scale the distribution of this content. So it was, we started realizing that the Internet was not really very well suited to be a broadcast medium like the, the television or the radio was. And um, more recently, we've been uh, seeing more struggles with uh, very large content. Um, so mm -hmm. if I were to ask you whether the Internet is a preferred medium for distributed bulk, delay tolerant uh, digital content, um, probably the, the answer is, is that not beyond a certain size. Um, if you think about a, a lot of uh, movies, home videos, data, data backup, scientific data today are not going over the internet, are still going over either dedicated networks, very expensive private networks, or parcel delivery systems like the postal service. Um, so the best example is Netflix. You know, more than 10 million users in the US, uh, 1.5 million DVDs per day. So that's roughly 2.5 petabytes a day. Um, if you compare it with some re recent figures that Cisco released, um, all US peer-to-peer -peer traffic is roughly 14 petabytes a day, which means that Netflix is carrying a significant fraction of the uh, traffic, of the video traffic that is being distributed in the US on any given day. But that's not the only uh, example. Um, 
probably you know uh, um, that a lot of times when you want to do replication of uh, data across data centers, um, a lot of the th times what you do is you take the machine, you uh, um, uh, uh, install the software, you put all the data in, and then you put it in the FedEx, and then you ship it to the location where you want to uh, um, have the, the server running. Uh, even CDNs, a lot of the times, uh, that their business is to distribute content when they have massive amount of data to distribute, like, for instance, the log files that they need to uh, mm, um, look into and, and, and study, uh, they actually distribute it using postal mail, mail service. Another example, the CERN the, the, uh, in Geneva, um, every day it... Uh, uh, exchanges roughly about 20 terabytes of data, of scientific data, across different uh, universities in the world and research centers. And to do this, they actually build a private network. And if you look at the public internet, the, the, the internet, how well it is dealing with um, uh, bulk data transfers, for instance, the peer-to-peer -peer traffic that we are seeing today, um, we are seeing a lot of signs that it is, sometimes it's struggling to cope with that amount of load. Um, it seems as if the current bulk data demand is higher than what the Internet can handle. And um, the solutions out there are not the most uh, uh, interesting ones. You know, we get uh, solutions where you can play with uh, pricing schemes and uh, you can change uh, uh, to very sophisticated congestion-based pricing schemes and the, the users don't understand it. The ISPs, it's hard for them to, uh, um, to track how to do this. Um, then the other solution is, uh, you know, you block these transfers and, you know, it's a complete fiasco um, uh, for the users and for the ISPs. And, um, and then the third option is to have some daytime volume caps. However, this is also very hard for the users because they need to keep track of how much volume they have consumed and uh, on the long run uh, it doesn't work. Uh, my own experience, I don't know if you've ever tried to move one terabyte of data from one side of the world to another side of the world. Um, it's actually a, a nightmare. I had this experience when I was at Microsoft. We had a one terabyte of logs that we wanted to ship from Redmond into Cambridge. And uh, what was happening is that when there was congestion in Cambridge, it was uh, not congesting in Redmond and the other way around. And uh, uh, the, the bill was so, so huge that at the end we ended up uh, getting into a plane and uh, recording everything into a hard drive and bringing it with us. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, there is a recent report by uh, Tom Layton um, showing that um, the effect of distance uh, is uh, being seen as more and more pronounced every day on the Internet, where you actually have, this is the data of how, how long it takes to download the DVD file, as you go further away into the network. And uh, you can see that the time to download the file can actually change between 12 minutes to several hours, uh, depending on how far you go into the network. And another thing that we're seeing is that not only the further we travel into the network, the more bottlenecks we are likely to see, but also these bottlenecks are time dependent. And um, I, I'm gonna show you some more data later, and I'm gonna dive a bit more into it, but you will see how at different times of the day, the uh, congestion levels are completely different than at different times of the day, and this changes in different parts of the world. So, what is the real problem? Well, the real problem is that the, the internet was, is not very well suited for delivery. It was very well designed for communications, but, uh, it was designed with uh, um, bulk and instantaneous delivery, again, uh, sorry, short and instantaneous delivery. And what we're seeing with these large files is bulk and delay tolerant uh, traffic. So the result is that you're, if you're trying to rush these large data files over the network, it's either very expensive or impossible. Um, you either get charged a lot of money because of volume-based uh, charging, or you start experiencing some um, congestion in different parts of the network. Some of the reasons is that eventually not all the bits cost the same, and actually not all the bits are equally important. And today, the network, it just treats all bits, regardless of whether they are interactive or delay tolerant, indiscriminately. Uh, so. Let's step back 
for a second, try to think about other industries, how they solve this problem. And if you look into the physical world, uh, there is actually industries like FedEx that they've been looking at this problem for a large number of years. And um, so what if we start thinking about the internet rather than a telecommunication network as a cargo uh, distribution network? So you could think that in the same way that you go to the FedEx webpage and you say, I want to take this parcel and I want to ship it from point A to point B and I want it to arrive by this time, it's going to charge me this much money. Uh, if I want it to arrive by this other time, it's going to cost this much more. A similar thing could actually be done in the Internet with different amounts of data that you want to transmit from one place to another one. So... How does it work with FedEx? Well, FedEx, they have all these local offices, all these local branches, where you actually take your parcels and you give it to them, and uh, that's it from there, and you forget about it. And then they take it, and then they have a delivery network uh, made out of uh, um, planes and made out of trucks, uh, where they actually try to optimize the delivery of the information from one part of the world to another part of the world to make sure that they can uh, take the cheapest flights or that they can, um, uh, when they arrive in the ground, that they can take the shortest path to the destination. And then they have something that they have these um, warehouses where they actually store a lot of the content um, in fa big facilities to make sure that they can uh, take the cheapest flights overnight or that they can take the best route. And they store all the content there and they don't uh, route it immediately. Now, if you look at today's internet, it's very good at routing. You know, it's very good at connecting point A with point B. Um, however, what if we were to think about the internet as a postal service? Um, what would it require? Well, we would have the same internet that we have today, uh, routing from point A to point B, but then we would need some kind of post office, um, uh, internet post offices, right? It would be some boxes that are close to the, to the user, that uh, the user has this large video file, or has this information, and just uploads it very fast to these boxes and then forgets about it. And then you also have these transit storage warehouses that are uh, big facilities that you use to schedule the information uh, from point A to point B, and you store it at different places to make sure that uh, you minimize the costs of delivering from one place of the network to another place of the network. And obviously, you need some intelligence in the middle to be able to uh, sort all these things out. Now, there is a lot of debate currently on the uh, new internet design and whether we should uh, redesign the internet from scratch or not. So there is a question of, well, uh, should this be a revolution or an evolution? Um, and I think it can be implemented in both ways. What would be a revolution? The revolution would be to think about the internet as a FedEx for bits. Um, so the routers would need to include terabytes of storage. Uh, there would be new routing algorithms that they not only route across space, but they also route across time. And, um, you know, current algorithms, they, they route across um, time, but in the time span of milliseconds or seconds to avoid congestion control. But we never think about routing in the time span of hours or even days. Uh, and if we were to think about how to implement this as an evolution, then we would probably think about it uh, as building it as an overlay. And there would be a lot of things to learn from peer-to-peer -peer networks. And you could actually think how we could take some of the existing CDN infrastructures or large data centers and uh, recast them uh, into, uh, um, with some transportation logistics to provide some of the facilities that I discussed before. So if you're going to go and try to design something like this, I think there are still a lot of questions to be answered. You know, how many storage warehouses do you put and where? How many post offices? How big? Um, how do you do routing and scheduling across time and space? Uh, where do you store, store things for how long? How do you do reliability, fairness, etc.? cetera? Um, and then you can always try to design such system with two goals in mind. You can either decrease your transportation cost under a model where you're getting charged by the pick, or you can actually try to increase the data rate transfer under some flat rate based scheme where what you're seeing is congestion and that whether there is no elasticity in how much the bandwidth can grow and you just because you're paying flat rate. Now, I'm going to focus in the scenario where. Uh, 
you have all these data centers around the world, and then each of them is kind of um, subject to some uh, um, charging scheme based usually on uh, 95 percentile. And then what you want to do is you want to replicate information across all these data centers, and you want to do it with the minimum cost. Um, I'm not sure how, how, much, how many of you are aware of how ISPs charge for traffic, but it's usually based on what they call the 95 percentile. 95 percentile basically says that if you take the month and you divide it into five minute slots, um, and you measure how much traffic goes in each of these five minute slots, and then you remove the five percentile, the, the, the largest peak, then you get the 95 percentile, and that's how much you get charged for. So it's sort of a metric of the, the congestion that was created into the network at any, at any given point in time. And the reason for this is because a lot of the networks and a lot of the ISPs, they dimension their equipment and their networks based on peak hour load, uh, or, and they manage their traffic accordingly. So let me give you a, an example to illustrate uh, what happens if you don't uh, do something smart with these large uh, bulk data transfers. Um, this is a uh, typical load that you see in most equipment today, in routers or in servers. You know, you get these diurnal and nocturnal patterns. And um, uh, imagine that this is a link where you're experiencing this, uh, this traffic. And now what you have is you, you want to transmit this cargo data. It could be large data backups, or it could be some replication information that you want to transmit through from one place to another place. Um, if you just uh, send it like that on top of this link, what's going to happen is that the 95 percentile that is defined by this red line um, is going to be pushed all the way up. You see, all the load gets pushed all the way up, and in a similar way, the 95 percentile gets pushed all the way up, and therefore you increase your charges a lot. A smarter way of doing it is, uh, is a water filling uh, way. Well, you know, we have the same scenario as before. You have these uh, peaks and valleys, and then you have this cargo data that you want to transmit. Rather than doing the way that we described before, you can actually try to fit it into these valleys and um, being able to use the resources that are available uh, during off-peak times. Now, if you think about this cargo data, can, in a certain sense, it can be seen like the, the fat on the internet, right? And uh, we really need to move this fat. We need to make the, the internet more slim. We need to remove this fat and, 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 and create more spare capacity so we can actually pump a lot more data at cheaper cost. Now, uh, you could think, well, maybe the, the, the simplest thing, the solution is just to take the data and wait for the valleys of the network and then just push them in the valleys. Um, and is that enough? No, that, that is not enough. Uh, if you just push data into the valleys, um, you can end up in situations like this. Uh, the problem is that the valleys and the peaks don't overlap at different places in the world. Uh, when it is nighttime in the Europe, it is daytime in the US and vice versa. And um, if you're in different networks, if they carry carrying different types of traffic, they peak at different times. For instance, a residential network peaks at a certain time, and an enterprise network peaks at a completely different time. So the peaks and the valleys may not overlap. So if you just follow the valleys of one of the networks, you may hit the peak of the other one and vice versa. And this is a simple example that uh, exemplarizes that, um, that information. This is uh, the load at different links in, um, in routers in Latin America in uh, Europe and in China. If you're trying to send data in, uh, in the link in Latin America when it is um, um, night time, what happens is that in Europe it's already 1 p.m. and in China it's uh, 8 p.m. So what happens is if you're trying to rush this data end to end, you're going to incur a lot of churches in, in China or vice versa. <coughs> so what you really need is these transit storage warehouses. Uh, so you do impedance matching between these different waves that have these um, maximums and minimums, and you need to make sure that you do the proper scheduling like FedEx does with their planes and their parcel system. 
So let's um, let's see what uh, this would take. Imagine that you want to minimize uh, costs, that you have these post offices all around the world, that you have um, these internet warehouses where you can store information. This could be your data centers. And um, what you need to know is uh, you have some data um, that you want to replicate, that you want to distribute, and you want it to arrive by a certain deadline uh, because of consistency reasons or because some some SLA agreements. And... Um, you also need to know somehow the load, when is it that different links, links are picking at what times, and uh, so you're able, you're, able, you're able to predict the, the consumption patterns of, of these links or on these servers. And uh, you need to have some kind of rough idea of the cost, how much, what is the pricing for each of these links, which is usually a, a concave function because um, um, economy of scale is helping you, and the more you consume, uh, usually it flattens out the, the expenses. And then what you do is you can do some dynamic programming. I'm not going to go into the details of the actual the algorithmics of how you, you get this. But the end result is that you're able to schedule things very efficiently and get some very uh, uh, interesting reduction costs in how you transfer data from one point of the world to another point of the world. So let me show you some actual results. Um, we took the load from um, a large uh, wholesale ISP. Um, with uh, roughly 400 interconnection points and uh, pairing with roughly uh, another 140 ISPs um, over a three-month period, and we took their, their pricing of each of the interconnection points. And um, we uh, assumed that we were placing one of these internet post offices at each of the POPs and that there was a number of transit warehouses at this whole ISP, a wholesale ISP that would allow us to route information from one place to another efficiently. So um, the example was we wanted to transfer 27 terabytes from one point of the world to another point of the world, basically from any of these two pops from this um, large uh, uh, ISP. And we had a deadline of two days. And we wanted to compare two transfer policies. The first one was this end-to-end -end transfer. And then uh, the second one was the Internet Postal Service, where you were using these uh, postal offices and these transit warehouses. And we wanted to compare the difference in money uh, that it would take you between using one policy or using the other policy. And uh, basically, these are the results. Um, so you want to take, again, 27 terabytes from, uh, this is from Latin America to Europe uh, within two days. And um, the cost of an end-to-end -end transfer would be roughly $150,000. Uh, and uh, with the Internet Postal Service, this gets decreased by about a factor of 20. And the reason is because you're really trying to use these peaks and valleys of the network and store information in those places as much as you can uh, in a similar way that FedEx, FedEx was doing to minimize the cost of the transfer. Now, I, I just gave you one example. If you look at all the source destination pairs in this network, um, this is the amount of data that could be transferred with um, the Internet Postal Service, and this is with end-to-end -end at the same cost. So if I am just, uh, I just have this much money, how much data I can transfer with one mechanism versus the other mechanism. And uh, it turns out to be that all the points that are below the line, it means that with the Internet Postal Service, you can always transfer a lot more data that with the end-to-end -end transfer. And there are certain points that actually this difference becomes quite significant. So if I zoom out into these points and I look at um, uh, what these points are, are actually points uh, in the world, two pops that are, have some time difference in the world map. So for instance, information that wants to be transferred from the US into uh, uh, Europe or into Asia and so forth. But the interesting thing is that even if you want to transfer information across nodes that are in the same time zone, you still get benefits. And the reason is because it's not time, only the time zone that defines uh, when, peaks, when, when the peaks and the valleys get produced, but also uh, the utilization patterns of those networks. And as I was saying before, you may have networks with completely different utilization patterns. Some networks are serving some type of users or some type of content, and other networks a completely different set of people, and the consumption patterns and the peaks and valleys could be completely different. So what about the real FedEx? Um, you know, we did this exercise. What if we would take these 27 terabytes that we did for the previous example, and uh, 
we would like to transfer them from uh, Argentina into Spain. Um, so we actually did the numbers and we said, okay, how many disks do we need to fit uh, 27 terabytes? And it's roughly 30 disks at uh, one terabyte each, more or less. And uh, this is roughly 38 kilos. And then we went into the FedEx website and we said, okay, we want to transfer these from Argentina to Spain. It's going to take us two days. How much uh, would you charge us? And it turns out to be that it's roughly about $600. But this is only one shipment. Uh, um, but you need, uh, over the month, you would ha have to do 15 shipments if you want to have a continuous stream of information once every two days. Um, so over a month, you would actually get a $9,000 uh, charge for these 27 terabytes from Argentina into Spain. Now, if you compare that to the results that I described before, um, it was 144,000 with the end-to-end -end transmission, it's 9,000 with FedEx, and it's 7,000 with the Internet Postal Service. So what this means is that um, the Internet Postal Service is not always a win-win situation. There are a lot of scenarios that if you do things smart, that if you do things right, um, you can actually get a very convenient solution that is an online solution that actually provides you with similar cost to the ones that you're getting with FedEx, but uh, with a lot more convenience. And um, I believe that it's an spectrum of uh, data, volume, and uh, time deadlines and configurations where uh, the uh, FedEx can do better or worse than the Internet Postal Service. And uh, you just have to look at uh, uh, um, these parameters and, and, p and decide. But it's not, it's n n there is no clear winner. Depending on the situation, one or the other will do better. And then the, f the final thing that we did is we said, okay, um, rather than just taking one of these source destination pairs that was Argentina to Spain, let's try all the source destination pairs and see when is it that um, uh, FedEx is better than the Internet Postal Service or not. And it happened to be that um, this is the distribution of the cost for the Internet Postal Service, and this is the cost for FedEx. So it happens to be that if you draw a line here, about 70% of the source destination pairs in the network that we were studying actually have cheaper cost than FedEx. And only 30% of the source destination pairs had incurred more cost than sending it over the postal service. So, you know, reducing cost to push more data is great. Um, I think it's a, it's a very useful thing to do. Uh, but what about the scenario where we have flat rate, we pay just a flat rate, and then what happens is that we just experience different congestion levels at different times of the day. Um, and this is a lot of the things that many, many times it happens with residential users. They, you, they pay a, diff, a, a flat rate, and then the congestion in the network changes over the day, uh, depending on the usage that is uh, going over that network. So imagine that uh, um, you are a user, and um, you have a large amount of information that you recorded with your digital camera, and um, you want to transfer it from here to your family somewhere in the other side of the world, and um, you have a high-speed uh, fiber connection, and um, um, you want to do this point-to-point transfer the fastest way possible. But the problem is, as we've seen before, um, you get these bottlenecks in the network that um, uh, increase as you go deeper into the network, and then you get these congestion levels that change over time and that change at different places in the world. So how, do you, how can you schedule this transfer such that you maximize the speed of the delivery of this information from you to your family in the other side of the world? Um, so... Do such situations exist in reality? So if I try to do a transfer of data from here to um, Europe, will I see fluctuations in the speed that I see? And does that speed fluctuate over time? And is it different than the fluctuations that I will see if I transfer it to another uh, continent in the, others, in the other direction of the world? So we did some experiments where you take uh, a sender, uh, in the U.S. and uh, 
um, uh, in Berkeley and then you try to um, send it information into Barcelona. And, um, and then you have another uh, intermediate node in Seattle and uh, you try to do transfers you know, over 24 hours and you try to do an FTP and then you just measure the throughput that you're getting. Um, and uh, you're trying to do from Berkeley into Seattle and from Seattle into Barcelona. And basically you see these uh, large fluctuations over the, 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 the period of the day where you get the same peaks and valleys as the ones that I was uh, describing before in, uh, in, the, in the core routers of the internet. You're actually seeing the same thing in the access links of the internet. So um, let, me get, let me show you something for a second. Let me uh, step out of the presentation for a second. And, um, and I'm going to show you some, um, some data that confirms uh, these, uh, these peaks and valleys into the access networks of the users. Um, this is a tool that we built that basically is able to track the experience that uh, users, that BitTorrent users across the world are seeing in their access networks uh, through any ISP, through any... Um, in any country in the world. So basically we're able to know what type of experience a user using BitTorrent is uh, seeing in any, of, uh, I, any ISP in the world. Now, um, the color basically tells you more or less the average download speed that they're seeing. So you can zoom into different places of the world and uh, you can go into countries. Uh, you can zoom in into the UK and um, and then try to see what type of uh, experience the users are seeing in there. And uh, let me jump. And for instance, for the UK, you get information like this. Uh, this is um, the average speed that users are seeing in the UK when they're downloading um, BitTorrent. And this is the peak experience that they're seeing. And, um, and, and um, this, this is over a period of one day, and uh, most of the times, for, uh, for a lot of ISPs, you see a very flat experience, so over the course of the day, uh, nothing changes, but then, and then you see other ISPs like this one, you know, nothing changes over the course of the day, but then all of a sudden, look at this, you get things like this. You get things like uh, um, during the peak times of the day, the performance of the BitTorrent downloads actually uh, uh, decrease uh, to make room for other uh, interactive traffic. And uh, this is the case of uh, one ISP in Europe, uh, but this is the case of another ISP in the other part of the world in, in, uh, in, in America. And uh, you can see that uh, there is um, a similar variation into the available rate for this application. However, the times of the day at which this thing happens are completely the opposite. So when it is picking one side, it's uh, bottom on the other and vice versa. So the bottom line is that we are seeing more and more of these fluctuations of the available speed and the congestion across the world. And um, these fluctuations change over time. And we really need some smart mechanism like the one I described before to be able to schedule the data across these different peaks and valleys um, in the world. So what we did is we took all that data that we had collected from the tool that I described before that it basically tells you the available capacity that a, a BitTorrent user is seeing when it's unloading this bulk data across different ISPs in the world. And then we calculated uh, what would be the speed, the increase in speed, if they were to use some kind of um, uh, internet postal service like the one I described before to be able to transfer their data um, across all these different ISPs that uh, roughly we found about 60 of them that were doing uh, active traffic management. And um, um, you can see again uh, all these dots, if they are on the upper side of the plot, it means that uh, uh, the speed can actually increase versus uh, uh, just using the, the regular BitTorrent. And, um, and we got uh, uh, factors of speed improvement of up to five times. Um, so I'm going to conclude there. I, I think I've, uh, I've tried to um, discuss that 
the content distribution um, is something that was not uh, inherent to the to the internet design. Um, I think over the years we've seen the internet struggle to be able to cope with a large, massive content distribution, and often is push the internet to its limits. Um, and the reason is, you know, communications and bug delivery are completely different beasts. And in a sense, the internet was not fully optimized for that. And I, I really think we need to look again on, at how is it that we can enhance the current internet infrastructure uh, with uh, more storage, better temporal scheduling, uh, so we can increase the capacity or decrease the cost. And uh, finally, I think, um, you know, I describe um, two worlds that was the online world on how to schedule data in there and then the physical world, the FedEx. But I think there are a lot of opportunities to have to mix these two worlds and kind of make a system that could actually combine both of them. And it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be all the way physical or all the way online. It could actually be part of the way physical and part of the way online and so forth. And I think this is a, a space that is still open for, for design and, and exploration. So um, if you want to get more information, there are a couple of papers online. You can go to, uh, to our website and you can um, uh, read more over it. And uh, with that said, I'm going to stop there and open it for questions. Yeah, th so the question is whether we've looked at the interplanetary network. Um, no, we haven't, but um, the, 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 the problem there is different, is that you get very large round-trip times. Um, so, the, so, so the problem many times is that uh, interactivity it is very hard because of the large delays. And, um, um, but once you cope with that large delay, then being, you, you need to make sure that you maximize the available capacity. And the available capacity, the available throughput, once it's maximized, then you should be okay. Uh, but I can see how if you, um, if you want to transfer data from one planet into another planet, uh, then you could actually use intermediate planets at storage nodes uh, uh, in the same way that FedEx uses these warehouses to store the content, or even use it as storage warehouses for, for the Earth. Um, because depending on the rotation of the Earth, you can have uh, uh, some satellites or some uh, planets that actually uh, don't uh, move, uh, move at a different rate with respect to the Earth, and they could store information there such that when the Earth rotates, they could actually deliver it again. So that, I think that's a good idea. Right. So the question is, um, we've seen similar problems from the beginning of the Internet with uh, things like email. And, um, and then there was another second part of the question um, about deployability. What would be some concerns about whether um, the whole world has to adopt this before uh, it's actually being useful? Um, so, so you bring a good point. Um, things like email, they worked in store and forward. Um, the only thing is sometimes, most of the times, is um, the um, it was not optimized for bug delivery, and it was not optimized for for cost or delay. It was more like uh, uh, for co uh, for uh, connectivity purposes because I'm not connected online; they just store it in there. So the variables through which you optimize are 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 are, are different, and then you you need. Um, a larger number of uh, servers across the world to be able to optimize things properly. Um, so it, it is similar, but at the same time, it needs to look at the space, uh, at the wider space, to make sure that it optimizes this, uh, this solution. And then the second part of the question regarding deployability, I, I think um, I, I would see this like, um, like a large CDN um, or a company with a large number of data centers or a large telco with global presence just providing this facility of uh, uh, large data file transfers. And, um, and, and I think you can do an incremental deployment over that. Uh, you know, there is 
uh, if uh, one of the CDNs starts deploying a service like this tomorrow, I can see how enterprises could actually contract this service from this uh, CDN in the same way that they contract hosting. Uh, they could just contract a, a service to replicate data across the world, and then the next thing would be to um, provide it to the to the end users, so they could actually have their point-to-point -point transfers more efficiently. And I think this is probably something that will become more and more important. Probably the first. Um, 10, 15 years that we've looked at uh, content delivery, we've always focused into the very popular um, part of the of the of the SIP distribution that you get the uh, the very popular content accounts for most of the request. But we really haven't looked much at the very long tail. How do we optimize things? And as more and more content is produced, user generated, that content is only for uh, one user consumes it, and then the, the family uh, one user produces it, and then the family consumes it. And that content is really on the long tail, and and it's very hard to uh, use the traditional content distribution infrastructures to host that content efficiently. So you would probably need to start thinking about some of these other elements, like the one I described today to make sure that you do the distribution of this long tail of, uh, of information very efficiently. Right, so the question is, um, if you don't have enough servers in some places of the world, then it will be hard to provide the service, and why not uh, reducing some of the infrastructure that already exists, like for instance email, that they already have a large number of servers with, uh, with the storage. I, Sure, why not? I mean, um, I can think of email, but I can think of many other services that they also have a large number of servers and, uh, and storage capabilities. Um, I think uh, if you look at any CDN, or uh, they, they have uh, in the order of tens of thousands of, uh, of uh, storage capabilities around the world. But you could even think about it in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Um, you know, more and more uh, setup boxes and home gateways are becoming uh, capable of uh, doing the same thing that a PC is doing. And they, 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 they have a lot of storage. So you could actually uh, take it to the next level and think of the network, think of the home as an extension of the network, and start thinking how you could use that infrastructure there to, to, uh, to deliver um, services like the one I described now. Yes. Right, so the question is, um, I guess the question, the question is, uh, the, the BitTorrent data that we showed, um, is there a, a way of gathering it without having to send a large volume of information? Um, so I'm going to go over the details uh, of how we gather that. Actually, you don't have to send a lot of information. Um, so basically what we did is we took a BitTorrent client, um, we modified it, and this BitTorrent client, usually a BitTorrent client, opens um, um, 70 connections to talk to 70 peers, and then in parallel is downloading from four, and it keeps changing four uh, out of, in, the, in the range of the 70 to find the fastest ones. Uh, so what we did is we took a client, we modified it, and rather than opening uh, 70 connections, it's able to open 100,000 connections. Okay. So not only were we able to talk to 70 uh, peers, we were able to talk to 100,000 in parallel. And then once every five minutes, we switch, we terminate those connections, and we move to another 100,000 users. Okay. So over the time of the day, we were able to, uh, to talk to several millions of peers. Now, we don't download any content. We don't download anything. The only thing that we do is we listen to the messages that the peers are exchanging among themselves every time that they download a, a block of a file. So in BitTorrent, the way it works in a peer-to-peer -peer network, every time I download a block of a file, I need to tell my friends so they can, download the, they can download from me. I need to tell my peers. So that's the only thing that we do. We, we have this client. We connect to 100,000 uh, peers, and then we start listening on the exchange messages. So we don't participate in the data exchange. We just look at the at the metadata exchange messages, and we do that uh, once every five minutes over a large number of, uh, of peers, and then over a, the course of uh, several months, then we are able to map the world. Um, right, the, the cost comes from a real telco. So the, the question was, what are the assumptions that we used to compare the cost of um, FedEx versus the cost 
of uh, transferring the data over the network. Uh, the cost of transferring the data over the network are real costs uh, at, the, at the links based on the real 95 charges. We, we took the, the, uh, the actual charges, I think, from last year, 2008. So the question is whether we were looking at the ISP rates or the link rate. It was the wholesale, wholesale prices of the links. Right, the question is whether we looked at any wireless provider. Um, the answer is no, but I'm expecting that I'm expecting that the results will look similar, even more amplified, because in wireless the resources are even more limited. So the constraints um, in terms of um, utilization and cost of upgrading and deploying will be tighter. Sure, sure, probably the peaks and valleys will vary. Um, still, a lot of people are using 3G today as a, as a, a home broadband connection, and then you know it's a mobile broadband connection. So, um, so you're right. Maybe they can use it over different periods of time, even when they are at work or when they are uh, traveling. Um, so maybe the peaks that will be rather than having one peak, there will be multiple peaks during the day. Maybe when there is a break during lunch because you have your laptop with you. Uh, with the 3G card and so forth. So the patterns will change. Uh, and you'll probably need to adapt the algorithms to make sure that you adapt to those patterns. Right, so the question is, um, if you were to implement this, um, do you need some kind of entity that has a holistic view of the available capacities in different places in the world in the same way that FedEx has that information? Um, the answer is you, you, you need to have local information, but you need to have all the local information. But that's something that, um, most of the networks that uh, have presence in different points, they, they have. When uh, I'm wondering, when, when Google puts a server somewhere in the data center and, uh, and purchases some bandwidth from some ISP, they know the charges. They know the utilization of that link. They know when it's going to pick. Um, the, thing that, uh, the thing that you need to do is you need to predict the future. So it, it's not... It's not it's not as much the problem of um, knowing the cost and knowing the utilization of the links where you have presence, because that you, you can measure. Uh, it's about predicting the future. So, because what you're doing is you're scheduling over time. You need to, if you have a data transfer that is going to last over two days, you actually need to predict how the load is going to look over those two days. So you can actually schedule your information across the world. And for that, you need to have some good prediction mechanisms. Our experience is that a lot of these links, unless there is some uh, black swan effect that uh, all of a sudden something uh, drastically changes, are fairly predictable. Uh, so the same patterns repeat uh, over different days with some variations over weekends and so forth. But, uh, but the answer, so the answer is yes, you need to have uh, information about the links where you operate these nodes, and yes, you need to be able to predict the future, but I think both are doable. So let me see if I got the question right. So the question is, if you start looking at other applications that are not delay tolerant, that are more interactive, like for instance, video streaming, uh, video conferencing, is, is there enough bandwidth out there to, uh, to support those applications? You know, I, I think a lot of the times the, the, the problems has been on the access link, and the app link capacity. So I don't think it's been so much a, a problem inside the network as uh, in the core of the network as a problem in the access networks. And it's a technology problem. And it, a lot of them will go away with, um, with uh, fiber and, uh, and uh, with more symmetric uh, links. Um, I think exactly the point of this talk was trying to say that you need to make sure that if you have two types of traffic, one that is interactive, like for instance, video streaming or, or a voice conversation, and you have something else that is a lot more delay tolerant, like data backups or replication uh, or large movie transfers, you need to treat them differently. Uh, and uh, you can actually have a win-win situation. If you treat them, not only you treat them different, but, but you, you can also uh, um, optimize how you deliver each of them. And then you will be able to make a lot more capacity for both of them. So uh, the, the point of this um, Internet Postal Service was to treat these large bulk delay transfers in a smart way so you can actually make more room for the more transit uh, um, delay uh, sensitive applications like the video streaming one. 
Right. So the question is, <clears throat> what type of traffic is amenable for this uh, um, infrastructure that I described before, and, um, and whether we've looked at uh, at uh, what type of traffic in today's internet uh, could fit this profile? Um, so I, I, I think, as you said, uh, mostly I would look. I would think of. Um, um, a large amount of the peer-to-peer -peer traffic that is happening out there, um, which is a significant fraction of the of today's internet, um, is delay tolerant to a certain extent. Um, you know, people leave their movies to download, and then most of them they they download when they're away uh, overnight, or um, so there is some certain delay tolerance in there. Yeah. Right. So the question is, um, if if we start caching illegal content, won't we run into trouble? Um, you know, caching uh, for a long time, it's been having its up and downs. Um, at times, we there was even an attempt in the EU to ban caching altogether because uh, the cache was hosting some content on behalf of uh, of another provider. Um, and... Um, and um, they, at a certain point, they were saying that they were not respecting the time to leave TTLs of the CNN page uh, so they could actually absorb a lot more of the load. Um, so I, I think you're right. In certain situations, you will probably need to look at what type of content and being able to, um, to maintain the rules by which the content provider wants that content to be treated. And some of them, they want to market as non-cacheable, and some of them, it's uh, illegal content, and you're not going to be able to store it. Um, but I, I'm seeing more and more of the content that is being um, uh, consumed by users going into more legal um, ways of uh, distribution, um, more legal frameworks. Like, for instance, if you look at uh, something like Spotify today, I don't know if you use Spotify, it's an online uh, system where they provide you a uh, most a uh, large fraction of the of the music content that is out there, and they're using a peer-to-peer -peer system. Is peer-to-peer uh, um, by itself? It's just another medium of distribution, uh, but they, they just frame it into a way that they were using it uh, with um, agreements with the majors and the providers. They said, okay, let's use peer-to-peer -to, -peer to reduce the cost. So, bottom line, I think you'll have to go. Through, I, I don't think uh, saying peer-to-peer -peer or no peer-to-peer -peer is um, is uh, uh, can be attached to saying it's illegal or illegal. It's just a different transport medium, and you can actually use it uh, um, uh, as a separate way of transferring your content. Um, so what I was saying before is that the peer-to-peer -peer traffic. I'm, I'm not. I don't mean uh, the the. Uh, I, I mean that there is a lot of uh, movies and there is a lot of content that now is being transferred over peer-to-peer, -peer, but tomorrow it could be transferred over a CDN or it could be transferred over the network like the one I described. Oh, I understand, understand your question. So the question is, peer-to-peer -peer networks are very good at handling the very popular content because the more people request the content, the more nodes are there to serve it, and therefore, you know, uh, naturally the capacity of the network it expands. Uh, but now you're telling us that it's more about user-generated content, about a user that wants to send it from Argentina into uh, Spain, and how are you going to handle that? Um, so that's true. That, that, that's exactly what I was saying before. Uh, I think uh, over the course, over the period of the last 10 years, we've been able to design very good content distribution systems to deal with very popular content, like CDNs and caching. And I think on the next wave, we are seeing a lot of the content that is being user-generated that is non-cacheable, right? And for that, um, uh, traditional systems like peer-to-peer -peer or like... Um, um, CDNs are doing are going to do a poor job because you are always um, running into the problem of the of the miss ratio. Uh, you, you store it in the cache and nobody else wants to see it. So that's why the infrastructure that I was presenting today is more amenable to be able to transfer information from one part of the world to another part of the world, even if only those two entities are the ones that want to see it. Now, the the part of what I was talking about peer to peer is you need to use this intermediate storage to be able to do the mismatching between the different peaks and valleys in different types of the world. And this storage node, rather than being sitting in the network, could be sitting in a user's computer. And that's the part of the peer-to-peer -peer 
angle, not so much the traditional swarming effect that the more people come, um, the better it works. It's more like using some notes as helpers to be able to store this information and be able to do the, the, the difference um, between the, the valleys in different times of the world. Well, you know, if you look at the SIP distribution, usually you, know, you get, we did a, a, a study of the Jupiter traffic a couple of years ago, and um, it was more on the 60-40 uh, rule. Um, so you, you get something like the long tail is roughly 30%, um, 30 to 40% of the traffic. So we, we are very good at optimizing the 60%, but then the other 30, 40%, we have a hard time. So I, I truly believe that if you put some um, uh, system that uh, starts understanding the differences of the uh, two endpoints in terms of peaks and valleys, and you use something like that, you'll be able to optimize for that 40%. Yep. Thank you.